Greetings, everyone. Welcome, welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am Ajwa, your Wisdom Wednesday coordinator and host. And we are so happy and pleased that you are able to join us for the first Wisdom Wednesday lecture for 2022. Yay. I invite you all to also go to our website, ikgculturalresourcecenter.com. Go there tomorrow and you will see posted the 2022 flyer and um, order of lectures for this year. So thank you all so much for joining us. Um, IKG Wisdom Wednesday is a free monthly lecture series that is normally held here in Washington, D.C., yet due to COVID, we have been virtual for almost the past two years. So um, one of the blessings in that is that we are able to expand our audience and our presenters. So we are, we are taking advantage of this opportunity to have our Wisdom Wednesdays um, electronically and be able to share this with people from around the world. So as we're looking in the chat, we can see that we have people from all over joining us. And as always, I want to acknowledge those of you who are, um, are sharing your time and energy with us today. And we know that we are in a webinar, so we're not able to see each other, but we can still feel the energy. So I'm going to just call out a few of the cities um, and places that are in the house tonight. We have Portland, Oregon, Los Angeles, California. We have North Carolina, Texas, New Jersey, Georgia, Mexico. Okay, I know our speaker's gonna be happy to see that we got folks from Mexico here, Alaska, New York, of course, Washington, DC. Uh, let's see, Maryland, always in the house. Thank you, Maryland, Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi. We have Rich Virginia, uh, more from Mississippi, Canada is in the house, Brooklyn, all right, Pasadena, California, Trinidad, Cleveland, more greetings from Virginia and Maryland, Illinois, Chi-Town, Chicago, more people from Portland, Oregon, let's see, Staten Island, all right, okay, thank you. Atlanta, Georgia. All right, so we got some representation from not only the United States, but some uh, surrounding countries. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. Before we begin tonight's program, I would like to share with you an event that will be taking place for those of you who are in the Florida area. So Akebalan Nation, False Progress, Ipet Isuk, and Patrick Desire presents Hidden History of Africa Lecture Series Part Two. This is a lecture featuring IKG's founding director, Anthony Browder, and co-director, his daughter, Atlantis Browder. This event will be taking place on Saturday, February 5th, and it's at a venue in Pup Pompano Beach, Florida, 33113 West Atlantic Boulevard, Pompano Beach, Florida. And events, I'm sorry, tickets for this event can be ordered at eventbrite.com. So again, go to eventbrite.com, search for Hidden History of Africa Part Two, or you can screenshot this image and support, support this venture. All right. So I'm going to leave that up for you all, give you a few more seconds to uh, take a screenshot of this image. Again, Saturday, February 5th, doors open at two o'clock and the event goes from two to six. And the new venue for the event is 3113 West Atlantic Boulevard, Pompano Beach, Florida. And again, go to eventbrite.com and type in Hidden History of Africa, part two. And that is Africa with a K. All right. Okay, so now um, for tonight's presentation, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Tony Mokjatji, 
Humber, Dr. Tony Humber. And let me tell you a little bit about our speaker. She is a professor emeritus from the Ethnic and Women's Studies Department at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. And she is the founder and curator of Where Black is Brown, the African Diaspora in Mexico, or WBIB. WBIB explores omic historical sites discussed in the Came Before Columbus and Early America Revisited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema and investigates the cultural influences and historical contributions of Africans in Mexico. From the ancient omic civilization, mother culture of the Americas to the colonial enslavement period to contemporary Mexico. Dr. Humber has presented her research at the Sotelic Language and Culture Institute, the annual meeting of the Black Towns and Peoples, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History Incorporated, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, and several California State Universities University of Southern California and numerous community organizations. In 2011, for the closing forum of the Los Angeles County's Museum of Arts exhibition, Omic Colossal Masterwork of Ancient Mexico, Dr. Humber presented the argument for the African influence in the ancient Omic culture, a perspective totally ignored in the exhibition. In 2016, Dr. Humber curated an exhibition of photographs and artifacts from her WBIB research at the Museum of African American Art in Los Angeles, California, as well as an exhibition in Pomona, California in 2005. From 2006 through 2009, she co-led the African Diaspora in Mexico tours with Mother Tanetta Muhammad, esteemed member of the Nation of Islam, and wife of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Dr. Humber currently serves as Vice President and Scholarship Chair of Our Authors Study Club Incorporated, Los Angeles branch of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History Incorporated, founded in 1915 by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, father of Black history. Since 1985, she has led tours that celebrate the cultural and historical accomplishments of the African Mexican founders of Los Angeles and their descendants and African Americans who have contributed to the greatness of Los Angeles and California. So we are so happy to have her tonight speaking on Where Black is Brown, the African Diaspora in Mexico. She writes, recognition of an African root and the heritage of Mexicans and the consequent cultural influences of Africans in Mexico often has been discounted and ignored. Populations of African Mexicans have been rendered invisible in the ideological consciousness of what, is, of what it means to be Mexican. Where Black is Brown, the African diaspora in Mexico is designed to further the understanding of the African influence and contributions to the diverse cultures and histories of the Americas, from the ancient Olmecs to the colonial enslavement period to contemporary times. It elevates the importance of Mexico's African roots and counters the denial and obfuscation of the existence of an African presence in Mexico. Furthermore, it adds significantly to our knowledge base about the depth and range of the African diaspora from our nearest Central American neighbor, Mexico. Foundational to this presentation is the research of Ivan Van Sertema, author of They Came Before Columbus and Early America Revisited, and his revelations about the historical and cultural influences of an ancient African presence in the Americas. Tonight, Dr. Humber will share her research from the African diaspora and Mexico tours she co-led with Mother Tanetta Muhammad. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed presenter, presenter 
Dr. Humber. Thank you. Am I on? You are on. Yes. Okay. Wow. Hotep, hello. I see some family and friends are on. Uh, what an honor. Um, Certainly, uh, Dr. Van Sitterman's work has influenced and inspired many of us, but this presentation and my journeys began in 1980 when I read his book, They Came Before Columbus. When I started teaching at Cal Poly Pomona, I used his textbook in many of my uh, beginning African-American study courses. And so uh, when I had an opportunity to have a sabbatical in 2003, I decided rather than go to Africa, I had elderly parents I wanted to be nearby, I went to Mexico to do research on the African presence in ancient America and ended up doing more than that. So this presentation is not only about Olmecs, it certainly is about um, the diaspora within Mexico. And, you know, and the purpose of this also, at the time this work was beginning for me, there were a lot of conflicts in schools between black and brown high school students. I had um, an exhibit in 2016 and there were protests in terms of the information. So this can be, uh, sensitive to many people, but um, I'm presenting the truth that I know that I've explored and I've had an amazing adventure. And I realized today that uh, next year will be my 20th anniversary of my sabbatical and uh, taking people to Mexico. So I'm very excited to share with you and uh, I'm ready to go. Share screen. Yes. Okie dokie, let's see how this works. Oh, this is it. Yay. Those of you who know that I'm very technically challenged, I'm excited. Wow. Okay. So my research is called Where Black is Brown, the African Diaspora in Mexico. And again, this has been my logo for uh, 19 years. Uh, and we'll move on. I like to begin with this, those of you in DC know this, it's a, a part of a, a Civil War monument to uh, African-American men who uh, served in the Civil War and I love it. I use it as uh, Mother Earth, Mother Father God, praying for us in our trials and tribulations and as we move forward in this country, may we be blessed by the soul and peoples of Africa. May we embrace one another and carry on with the truth that we seek to share with others. Ashe. So when I first went to Mexico, one of the museums I went to had this sign. And the second time I went back to that museum, the sign was gone. So I really like it. Afro-Mexicanos, el color is what? Invisible, it's invisible. And that is what I found a lot. Uh, a lot of my research also, uh, not a lot, but it's been influenced by, I've read Our Roots Run Deep, uh, The Black Experience in California that has an article about Queen Calafia, never heard of her and have since uh, been very attracted to that prospect. And so I named her the Queen of California. That's uh, from her name, we get California. And I also say that she is the queen mother of, of, of the African diaspora. I think she was that kind of a powerful, she's a mythical character, but there is research that there were African people, um, you know, many, many hundreds of years back that lived in California and certainly lived in the United States. In 2001, I uh, went to Cuernavaca, Mexico to take a Spanish class. And because I was the only black person and they knew I was interested in the African experience in Olmecs, they brought a professor in. And as he was speaking in Spanish, and mine is pretty poor, he said, Puente Tembembe. And at that point I had to get up and leave the room because I almost cried. Because Tembembe is not a Spanish name. Puente C, Tembembe, it's not. Uh, it roots have to be African in the way it's structured. And so it took me about three years to find this sign. <laughs> it's a little river that's polluted, but I found it one night. So I'm really excited. So it reminded me of uh, in the nineties, I had a chance to visit uh, South Africa. We met uh, Winnie Mandela and she said, those bones in the Mississippi river are our bones too. And for me, I know our bones also may be in the Timbimbi river. And so I'm there. I can't do this presentation without, as it says, in loving memory of Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Uh, those of us who love his work, really respect and honor his work, are excited every time we have an opportunity to present uh, information that supports him as well as enlarge his research. So this is what I say about him. Uh-oh, can't read everything. 
What manner of man was he to follow his truth, passionately create pathways for knowledge about African peoples to become commonplace, no longer reserved for debate and discussion within the confines of the academic world? Would fires burn within his heart to live a life of personal sacrifice, to become a truth seeker? What spirits from an ancient past called upon him and anointed him to be the one to say they came before Columbus. I presented this uh, piece uh, at his tribute in June 27, 2009. What did he do? He waged war against centuries of racist lies and falsehoods about African peoples. His analyses sculpted a new perspective about African peoples, their peopling of the world and their profound impacts on world culture and civilizations. His research had depth and breadth and it is awe inspiring. His interdisciplinary research with a core of international scholars has endarkened the world. And I use endarkened to say, and darkened, be in darkened to see the light, I should. These are the areas of evidence. I remember him saying, I think in anthropology, you need at least two supporting evidences to prove a point. Well, he has many. He had eyewitness accounts, including Columbus on two journeys and his son. Met allergic evidence. Um, Indigenous people said that they saw black African people when they had gold tipped spears and with uh, the analysis of the metals, it can be traced to Guinea. Linguistic evidence, there are a lot of terms that are um, used in the Americas, <coughs> including in Panama and in uh, certainly uh, Mexico that can be uh, parallel to uh, language in West Africa, botanical evidence, skeletal evidence, oceanographic evidence, looking at the cur cur currents, cartographic evidence, looking at maps, navigational evidence, who could uh, sail those ships here, iconographic evidence would be your artifacts, epigraphic evidence would be script, ritual correspondence that we can find parallels to Africa, toxicological evidence, uh, they found uh, was it cocaine and tobacco in the in the stomachs of mummies, and it's not uh, indigenous to Africa. It comes from America, and then Arabic historic documents with oral evidence, and it'll be the story of Abubakar II as one. So here it is: the African presence in ancient America. They came before Columbus by Ivan Banister. Everybody, give a yay on that one. <laughs> And also he talked about Alexander von Ruthenau was the man who showed him evidence that indeed there had been an ancient presence and in unexpected faces in ancient America. In his book, uh, Van Sertima borrowed several of his figures uh, that show he said an, an African uh, cultural influence, a Semitic cultural influence, an Asian cultural influence and a European cultural influence. And then uh, there's a book, Ramsey's the Third Father of Ancient America. Uh, ironically, I believe uh, Jurassic Boy taught at UCLA and I didn't realize he taught there until after I had discovered information in this book. But there's a piece in uh, this book called uh, Opening of the Mouth Ceremony. And he found parallels with this opening of the mouth ceremony from ancient Egypt to ceremony in Mexico. And then Early America Revisited. If you haven't gotten the K before Columbus, uh, Early America Revisited, uh, I like, I used it in a class, it was shorter, it was more succinct, and he really got to the point in terms of really explaining his point. And he goes into uh, good detail, he's got uh, good photographic evidence. And so uh, if someone doesn't want to wade through uh, the K before Columbus, I recommend this one. So the whole point I've been asked, so do you have proof that Africans came here? Where is the uh, evidence uh, genetically? How do you know their boat sailed? And so we know that there were a lot of myths about African seaworthiness. One was in the West, and that was including Southwest Asia, uh, were the leaders who, who believed that they had advanced technical progress that did not exist among other peoples. Other areas of the world did not have equal or, or superior sailing craft or navigation, navigational knowledge. Uh, Columbus has talked about the 15th century European ships. It said um, that uh, successful trans-oceanic vo voyages only with difficulty. So the Europeans made voyages with difficulty and they must have been superior to those of a thousand or 2000 years earlier. How do they know? 
uh, the polygenesis of who believe in the origins of multiracism said watercraft of pre-Columbian times could have crossed the oceans only accidentally and by miraculous good fortune, that it was miraculous good fortune that Africans indeed could cross. And if you go to a point uh, below the equator, it's what, I forgot how many miles it is from say Angola to Brazil, but it's not, not as far as you think. Therefore, there could be no significant influence on ancient America from beyond the seas. In other words, after people just stayed on the coast, they never ventured out beyond the horizon. Uh, that goes with that belief system. Certainly behind the Great Pyramid of Kuvu is a ship that was put together and easily navigable on large bodies of water. And if you look in Early America Revisited, he really discusses the seaworthiness in other ships. Matter of fact, I believe there was a ship from China that transported an elephant. I remember seeing that. And of course, in his text, he gives us the maps of the currents. I never thought about the currents. They were like conveyor belts. If you're on one side, you'll go to the other side and eventually it will take you back to where you started. And so he really goes into that. And then uh, Thor Heyerdahl, I remember as a child when uh, he did something with Kontiki, I think taking a raft to Polynesia and I remember Ra too, that shows you how old I am. But he recreated the, the voyages across the Atlantic in a reed boat in 1970. And so what Heyerdahl had proven in effect was that the most ancient Egyptian ships, predecessors even more, sophisticated, uh, boy, I can't see everything, made, uh, could have crossed the Atlantic. They had sophisticated ships and they could have crossed the Atlantic. So he takes that as a possibility. Okay, so let's go to Bubakar II. When I read uh, They Came Before Columbus, every presentation I made, I talked about 1311, Abubakar II. I had people, teachers, adults, children, everybody saying Abubakar II because I find his story so intriguing. And so he was the big brother of Mansa Musa, who, who is more well known. He's called, uh, he's called the, the Mariner King. And he sent a group of people out on the ocean to find what he thought was something beyond the uh, Atlantic's pool on his side. And they came back, one person came back and said, yes, other people went over uh, an area, but he came back anyway. So Abubakar II decided he was going to take that trek and he leaves his position as leader of his people in 1311, he conferred the power of regency on his brother, Khan Khan Musa, on the understanding that Khan Khan was to assume the throne. And then in 1311, one day, dressed in a flowing white robe and a bejeweled turban, he was in a grand boo-boo and I know the wind was blowing and he was looking lovely. And he took leave of Mali and set out with his fleet down the Senegal River, heading west across the Atlantic, never to return. He took his griot, Coyote, and half his history with him. And so we don't know where he landed, but we certainly can find some um, evidences of influence of Mandingo. We find that in Mexico also. But this uh, took this in, a, in a museum and it's a, a plaster, uh, replica of someone's face. And it looks very Mayan to me, if you know what Mayan people, uh, the physiognomy is. And it's a beautiful piece. And I'm not saying that this man has uh, African influence. I'm saying it is a man. But what I am saying is this does. And here is where the rub is in this presentation. There are many people who deny and say, well, you're just looking at superficial physical characteristics. Uh, but when you look at this, as Van Sertima so clearly says, and other people, how can you create these images of each of these massive stone heads without having seen an African? That's the question. Uh, the Olmecs 1300 BC to 300 BC, I've had various uh, dates, so I just put a question on that. But uh, in October 2010, at the when the LA County Museum had their Olmec exhibit, there was a Friday discussion and they talked about the Cascajal stone or the Casca Hall rock. And this rock uh, was a tablet and it has 62 characters. Some believe it was a, a list of food, but it is credited with being the oldest writing in the Western hemisphere, credited to the ancient Omex. These are my nephews. I took them to the exhibit. I want them to know that uh, they too uh, derived from graves. 
Okay. And on this map, if you look at some places as Chilcot Single, I've been there. I've been to Hootslawaka on the lower left. Uh, Trace of Pothas, I've been. La Venta, I've been. And where else? And there's some other places that are not on this map. But these are the sites where the Olmecs came. I love, this is my favorite Olmec, San Lorenzo Monument number four. Okay. And when you look at that, I think you're looking at an African man. It seems pretty obvious. But many people have questioned that. And they said, the wise nose and fleshy lips are something cited as evidence of an African origin of the Olmec. But the epicanthic fold where your eyelids are is the single most important racial feature. It harks back to the origin of Native American populations 30,000 years ago when people crossed the Bering Strait and settled this continent. I don't know about you, but the most significant feature on this monument is not his eyebrows and the epicanthic fold. You can't look at this without being awed by his features and his beautiful nose and lips. Let's talk about some hair. In the uh, book for this exhibit in 2010-11, they had this picture, although the head did not come to the museum. It's called Monument Q, and it has braids in the back of the head. And so in Early America Revisited, uh, Dr. Ben Serdema shows, you know, uh, a mummified body of a woman and the hair and is braided, cornrows, whatever we want to call it. We know that. So Christopher Poole referred to Monument Q and he said, this is the, is the more naturalistic carved of the two. He's talking about another head. And it is unique in the prognosticism of his jaw, the deep carving of his features and the bird-like shape of the top of its helmet with feathers that hang down the back of the head. And when I saw this, I was enraged because if you only show the front of this a monument, you have totally missed the point and, and how spectacular it is. And so this is the back of the monument. He said, what I call braids, he's saying, well, they're feathers. And on the lower right, you see my head, what it looked like in 2003. I, they don't look like feathers to me. They look like woven braided hair. And so went back to the museum and I have a fuzzy picture of this monument on the left. And as I recall, this had been uh, an, an altar that had been converted to an Olmec head. But on the back of it, it is very smooth. And if you look at the cascading hair, or is it feathers? For me, it looks like feathers. And so I took it another level. Again, you know, I do these journeys two or three times a year. This is not my, my total life's work, it's, it's, it's my hobby. But I look at the cascading, which I call feathers. I look at the old neck head monument cue with the braids. And then I had one of my best friends braid my hair. And then I'll, I'll let you, uh, determine what you think it is. He uh, Van Sertima also talks about the sacredness of number seven. I'm going to move on. He says, uh, I was on a flight to South Africa and sat next to uh, a Muslim man, and he talked about the properties of seven, uh, that you discipline them at seven children, educate them for seven, seven years between graduation from high school. Uh, at 21, they are ready to face the challenges of life. So I was showing him some of my slides and talking about the sacredness of seven and he was affirming it. Now this monument uh, artifact came to LA and I hadn't seen it before. And it, it looks um, almost like it's Rasta to me, but I counted the braids and I count seven. So that kind of uh, supports that notion. Uh, seven is not just an arbitrary figure, but a powerful and extremely significant symbol for them of divine and universal cohesiveness and for them would be African people. So we move on to a place called Trace of Postes. Trace of Postes this is one of the main uh, sites of artifacts that were found. I believe it was the, the first were found at Trace of Postes. So I go to Trace of Postes and there's this head. At the time I was there, I took this picture I took a picture of the back of the head. After I came back to the United States and met someone who has a museum in, in San Diego, he said, well, didn't you see, and I, and I had Dr. Van Sertema with me visiting San Diego. And he said, didn't you see the head with the shaved braids? I said, I don't, didn't see that. And then he showed me his picture and I said, oh yes, I saw that. So I took the back of the head, but didn't think anything of it. And it almost looks as if it has been shaved, I don't know. But certainly, maybe they were about to put braids in it, but it certainly has striations that could have signaled 
uh, cascading uh, braids. There's just another one where you can see that. Uh, there's a place in uh, Katimako uh, by a lake. It's a sacred site. Um, a lot of uh, ritual and tradition happened there. And they had this, the tennis scale is a sweat lodge. And they had this tennis scale that looked like a snake. Uh, the serpent was very significant in ancient Olmec, ancient Egypt, and, and other people uh, in the Americas. And so I was intrigued by this. And behind it, it had the two figures on the left. I looked at the opening of the mouth and the eyes. Uh, the lower one looks very Asian, but the opening of the mouth, how it's structured, reminded me of these two figures from the Nok culture. This is just superficially looking at it and maybe finding some parallelism. So any other scholars who want to carry it further on that, that would be great. And then, then to the, uh, at the same site in Catamaco and Better Cruz, they had just put this uh, image to the left. And when I went back a couple of years later, it was all green because of the dampness. But it is a figure that has the writing, that has the glyphs. And finally, I went to the museum in Mexico City and saw the original of these. And what you see also are the hieroglyphs in there and it's in the exhibit with the Olmecs. So it's during Olmec time. El Manati. So when people say, where is the evidence? Where's the DNA? And in the, the museum in uh, Santiago Tuxla, uh, moving farther down in uh, Veracruz, there's a museum, uh, El Museo Tuxtecla, I think that's the name of it. And they have an exhibit of the manatee. And these, this is a wooden figure and the manatee predate the old mix. But in this exhibit, they found in a bog uh, remains of children. And because they were in a damp area, the skin was preserved. And so there's a scholar in the University of Veracruzana, Professor uh, Sagrario Cruz Carretero, who's even asked for a sample of the flesh so that we can really tell what the DNA makeup was of these ancient people. Um, she's been denied that, and I hope that at some point someone can get that. My tour guide I had uh, during my sabbatical, he said, some of the monuments look like monkeys, including this one right here on your left. Uh, his ears look like Dr. Spock from Star Trek. His hyperextended jaw to me looks like a brother. And when I had my exhibit in 2016, a young man came by and said, looks like this brother just got his fro touched up. So the Olmecs knew what a monkey looked like. And to call these figures of humans and men like monkeys is certainly that embedded racism. And here it is, the astronomer. Um, Raul, who was my guide said that Eric Van Doniken, who wrote Gods from Outer Space, named it the astronomer. I see it as a holy man looking to the heavens. So uh, these uh, scholars here, Beatrice de Montagnano, Warren Barber, and Gabriel Haslevetta from the book Van Sertima's Afrocentricity and the Omex, they're very critical of him. Matter of fact, he took time in a year to write Early America Revisited to answer uh, their criticism of his work. And one of them said, this is a spinning image of a Native American. I agree if the Native American is of African ancestry. The Watch Guard, another uh, monument that was said to be called a monkey. It actually is in a pose, a yoga pose. It has a helmet, which are some of the characteristics of uh, these Olmec uh, rulers. And so people have called it a monkey. Uh, this is a replica of this. The original is in another site. I love this one. Oh my God, it was just such a powerful masculine piece. And so uh, Beatrice de la Fuente, uh, a, a scholar of uh, ancient Mexico said, a, it's a mythical being. Well, First of all, let's look at it with the widow's peak, uh, the, the, the pr strong prominent facial features. And right behind that widow's peak is a little opening and uh, it might've been used for sacrifice. You, it, it could hold uh, a liquid and maybe it was water put in there. Maybe it was what we don't know. 
And you can see people that put their hands on it, what have you. So as I looked at it and I was, we have an annual film festival, the Pan-African Film Festival. And there was a movie called Limits of Control in 2009. And I looked at the movie, didn't quite get everything in the movie, but when I saw this man's face, I thought, oh my God, we look at his cheekbones, uh, the, the shape of his face and the lines of his face. He even has a small widow speak, I'm thinking, he could have been an Olmec brother. Of course, this is really superficially looking at that, but to say he, this figure is mythical and then we take an African man who's Benin Nigerian, that would say that he is mythical and the two don't mix. You had to have seen someone who might've looked that way. Also among the collection of the Omex, you have this figure and these are were Jaguars. The Jaguar was very important. And so this is a collection. I particularly like the one on the bottom made of jade. And here's another one, just exquisite pieces. And jade was their special stone, not gold. There's a town called Zaza Katla. And one of my students was doing a presentation and she talked about Zaza Katla. And I said, well, I was going to Mexico this summer. I'm going to find that. Uh, Mother Tanetta and I, it was not far from Cuernavaca where we were based. And we found the town and it was next to a store. And on the side of the outside of the store, it had a big Corona sign. We're not drinkers, so that didn't make any difference. But anyway, this is what was in the, in the paper. And I did not take a picture of this man, but he's standing on what was an open field and below him are the ruins of the Olmecs. And it's really interesting because it is closer to the West Coast and not the East Coast of Mexico. And in these little niches, these little openings, they found these were Jaguars. Uh, one of them, I believe the one on the right was part of the exhibit that came to Los Angeles in 2010 through 2011. And here's some more books, The Mystery of the Olmecs by David uh, Childress and History of African Olmecs, Paul Barton, both speak to an African presence and also speak to an Asian influence. And one of them, oops, oops, was uh, the Shang Dynasty. This is a, a jade piece and um, that there was an African, uh, the Shang Dynasty was influenced uh, by African people. I believe that's how they might've stated it. Look at the hair. It looks sort of like the Mohican. And here, when you look at these artifacts from that time period, all of them have what we would call a Mohican. I particularly love the lady in the front. Oh my God, what she has around her neck, a jade necklace. Uh, she's got her hair, her natural hair puffed out. She's got her earrings. Obviously, she is royal and quite beautiful. The figure on the left, every time I've been to uh, Parque La Venta, where this is, people call it the grandmother. And then haven't seen the one at the lower, I'm trying to think where that one is. And the other one on the upper right, all of these are in Veracruz. Here's some other figures. The figure on the right is really important. Van Sertima talks about uh, cultural attributes that African people had, ethnic markings. And you look at the figure on the right and certainly the scarification is there. And this is a piece that's in the Mexican museum. The figure on the left, if you look at how the hair over the eyebrows is, it looks like it may be scarification or it could be the hair, we don't know. But the sister with the hands on the hip, love her. And what she has tied around her belt and it looks like it's a, probably a, a scarf. And the line and the, and the dots, the dot line uh, pattern has been attributed to the Maya as their mathematical system. And here we find it on the Olmecs. So they predated the Maya in terms of this nu numeric system. Here, I just put these, I thought they were beautiful. Uh, the one on the bottom, I believe might be a snake, but I just love it. And it's, it was a heavy uh, stone piece that was worn around the waist. The uh, figure of the head, absolutely beautiful. It could be uh, a man of African ancestry, some influence, but certainly the one on the left would be that also. I wonder if uh, De La Fuentes would call that a mythical creature. In the museum at Jalapa, and I hope all of you have a chance to go to Mexico and you go to Museo de, uh, de Antropología y Historia in Jalapa. I've forgotten the name of these. It's been a while since I've been there and I just ran across it today. You think you're looking at something in Egypt, but this is Mexico. And it, they have uh, brought in um, 
an entire uh, structure. And some of the images look like this are black and some are not. But uh, of course, I'm going to show you these because it's very strong and it shows a connection here in the Americas and antiquity. Uh, Richard Dial, a uh, scholar who writes about the Olmecs, said there's a figure called Yuguito from, uh, I'm not going to use the name, from Guerrero. The face of this dome, horseshoe shaped object, is clearly Olmec, but, featured, but features a flat nose. And this is the part that just keeps hitting me wrong. Uh, and unusually sensuous lips. As a scholar, I don't think uh, it's necessary to describe features in terms of sensuality. So here's the image on the left. This image, came, I've seen it in the uh, New York Metropolitan Museum and it was brought to Los Angeles and it is magnificent. Some people have said it's a child, who knows? As AIs look very Asian influenced. You look at the, the, the nose, you look at the lips, and certainly you may think African, African influence. Uh, but to call them sensuous lips, maybe so, but I might have described them a different way. And I kind of paralleled it to the Benin mask. I was looking at a picture of Harriet, and I thought, well, she might look something like that. Uh, the lady with the braids going, these two bottom pictures are from South Africa. For me, they kind of look somewhat similar. I have a student whose mother is from Ecuador and she gave me this postcard. Oh, this is way back 2007, eight, somewhere around in there. It looks rather Olmecish. So Ecuador might be explored and maybe there are artifacts there also, but I've just concentrated on Mexico. Egyptian parallels. Uh, we know the, the pyramid at Saqqara, the step pyramid by Imhotep, first pyramid, and then at La Venta, in Veracruz on the East Coast, the first pyramid is a, a dirt mound pyramid. And I've uh, added myself, you can't see me, but I stood on the top of that pyramid uh, June 21st at high noon, just happy that I was there and didn't realize that it was uh, the beginning of the summer solstice. That's gotta mean something. I've been on many mountains. This is a place called Chalcat Single. And in Chalcat Single, there is an Olmec carving at the crest of this mountain. You can see it on the right or the left. You kind of focus your eyes and it's got a hand that's raised up. It's got, it looks like it has a bracelet and it certainly, maybe it was a universal sign of peace. I tried finding this, but it earthquakes, it has slipped. And so you really need to be a cliff uh, climber to do that. Or maybe I say one day I'll get a helicopter and ride by it. And one of the uh, rangers of the park said, and people have graffitied all over it, which makes me very sad. Other parallels. Certainly we know the beautiful monuments of uh, Ramses at uh, Abu Simbel and uh, Luxor. And here we even have Lincoln seated that Tony Browder talks about, I'm sure, uh, on his tour. But at Chalcot Single, in a niche near that mountain you just saw. Here you have a seated royal figure. Some say it's a she, some say it's a he. Is El Rey or La Reina? Okay, not sure about that. And the circular pieces are clouds, but the bottom line is it's, it's a person that is seated and you don't see a lot of images of omics seated on a throne. So that may come back as a retention. And it also has a double crown. And so speaking of double crowns, double crowns, uh, Jurassic Boy said were found in Egyptians and in Chinese and, and Chinese in America. Okay, maybe I, I don't know if I got that right, but I'll look at it. Anyway, we're, let's look at this image and I found this image. My pictures are a little fuzzy. Let's look at the one on the right. It looks very European and very well, but he's got the earplugs and he's got the double crown. I think what is important is, for instance, I'm wearing something African, wasn't born in Africa, but I'm identifying with it. I wear Oggs all the time. I'm not from Egypt, but I identify. So we understand the appreciation of the culture and the continuation of it in our dress and practice. Another uh, retention that uh, he said in ceremony, here you have uh, two gods, one is horse, and I've forgotten the one on the left, can't think of it right now, but anyway, they are, they are pouring cascading Oggs over Pata. Beautiful. Uh, this is at Konombo, and Tony Browder knows it well. And it's a, just a closer look of these cascading arches 
would be the sustenance and water for life. Uh, this is what Van Sertima had in his book. Yeah, the one on the left is the, the cascading water. And then the one on the right, I had a student who spoke German and he translated the Schwarze Wasser to me. And he says it means the pouring of black water. Well, the image on the, the right is Olmec and it really parallels what you see that comes out of Egypt. And it's purification by the gods to restore Pharaoh's fluid in the afterlife. Uh, here you have the, the helmets with incised parallel the two at the top are from Egypt. I, I believe they're right in the uh, front of the Egyptian museum. And here you have the helmets uh, that are worn by the Olmecas. Explain the little black man in the cave. I had an experience to go to a cave, thought I was going to a Disneylandish kind of thing where I buy a ticket, stand in line, have a tour guide. That didn't happen. It's a long story I won't go into, but anyway, the bottom line, I ended up with a taxi driver and a tour guide and we go in this cave and we had to hike up a little hill and the tour guide said $20 I gave him and he unchained this gate. And when he opened it, it was sort of like that. And so we go in and one of the first things we see is this image, which I took a picture of and it's a mammoth bone. Well, I'd never seen that before. And so you see when you kind of bend under and, and go in deeper. And when you go in deeper, this is what it looks like. In this cave, there are two living things that I know of. There were bats and there was kind of a, a water bug on the side of the walls of the cave because it is very moist. Uh, six years after my tour, after my sabbatical, I found this picture. And I realized that I had been in that cave with all these bats. I was so busy seeing what I, I, I didn't remember seeing this. And if you kind of look up where the bat is uh, midway, anyway, there's a, a bat in flight. But I look at that and I, I just couldn't believe I was in there with all those bats and I was pressing on. Uh, you know, you had your columns. It, it looked like there was um, an amphitheater inside the cave. And then our tour guide, he took the formation and he played it and made a, a beautiful, beautiful sound. Uh, after that, I met uh, a, a doctor, excuse me, uh, Reverend Glenn Jimmett, and I have a picture of him later. And I told him I went in the cave and he said, you know, there could have been a cave in. <laughs> well, unfortunately there wasn't a cave in. So we hiked and, and we saw uh, these skulls and our tour guides said these were all like skulls. And then in early America, we visited and they came before Columbus. Uh, Van Sertima has this white picture, which shows an opening of the mouth uh, ceremony to restore the speech of the dead from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And you have a high priest with leopard skin with a scepter, a snakehead scepter in his hand. And then before him, you have the Pharaoh who is black with a curved beard. And then you, underneath uh, the priest's hand, you have these crooks. And then you have like a little cabinet a little storage unit. And then on the right, you have the Olmec equivalent. This is the fascinating part. The Olmec equipment ha equivalent has dots on it like a jaguar, jaguar. It has a snakehead scepter, but it's pointing down. It has a crook and it has a little man with a hat. And the last time I was in uh, Egypt was in 2007 with brother Renoko Rashidi. And I told him I wanted to get that at, in, in terms of papyrus. Couldn't find it, so the tour guides had one made for me, which I am eternally grateful. And so here's what I saw. When I came around the curve, and again, everything's black. Once you leave a space, it's totally dark. There, were no, there was no electricity. I came around out of a big open area and I saw this and immediately I knew what it was because I'd been looking at the black and white picture of it for years in my classes. And if you look close, you can see an earplug. Sometimes I can see the nose, it's hard to see the mouth. But it is obviously a human wearing the skins of the jaguar, the jaguar. His scepter is pointing down, his snake head, he has a crook in his hand, and there's a little black man in front of him with a goatee. So I try to get a, you know, this is a one shot deal. I use the university's camera, I'll blame my photography on that. And I'm looking at his goatee and the formation around his mouth, you can see it. But if you look at his ears, they're black and then the back part of the ear is, is brown. So uh, one of, Dial, who's uh, pretty on the Almec said, well, it's wearing a mask. And if it is wearing a mask, it's wearing a mask 
of a black face. Um, our tour guide who took us in the cave said it was a scene of sacrifice because it has a dog. There may have been a sacrifice, but it is to give the breath of life. And look at the parallels. Uh, you have, both have the scepter, both have the uh, orange and yellow clothing, the animal's tail between the legs, the little black man with the beard. What is different is the scepters in opposite hands and the scepter, one is down and one is up. And then about a half an hour, by this time I'm in this cave for two hours with the bats, we come across the jaguar, the jaguar, and the serpent. And interesting with the serpent, if you look by the eye, it has the X's like you see in cartoons. One of my students pointed that out to me. And here's another look at the snake. So we, we know the significance of the jaguar, the jaguar, the significance of the snake, the serpent in Egypt, and we know the significance in the Americas. And we say goodbye to Husla Waka. I'm gonna move quickly to uh, the Ma'afa, the African Holocaust. Uh, Aguirre Gonzalo Beltran is an anthropologist who is considered the foremost authority on African heritage in Mexico. And this is, the left is the cover of his book called Quila. Quila. And I happened to go into, I'm in Oaxaca, and I happened to go into a shop that sold masks and I saw the one on the right. I didn't buy it, but it certainly parallels the one on the left and certainly I believe they're ceremonial. We know that the first enslaved Africans in the new world, there was a burial ground in Campeche. Again, a student presented this information to me in class and, and I had a chance to finally get to Campeche and, and look for this site. And so what is in this site are skeletal remains at that point they believe are the oldest buried remains of Africans in the America. Now, every one in that grave is not of African descent. And how did they know those that were African from others? They knew by dental markings, the shaving of the teeth. If you saw Amistad, there was a character who had pointed teeth, ethnic uh, markings. If any of you are in New York and you go to the uh, Sankofa Museum, uh, the African burial ground, they talk about, they identify the African, Africans by their shaved teeth. Van Sertima says in 1250, there were skeletal remains found on St. John, I believe, or St. Thomas. And, you know, they analyzed it and they also had the shaved teeth. And the Jalapa Museum, they also say that the Mayans also had the practice of shaved teeth. But certainly I can look at three instances where African remains signify that the people were African. I went to the Museo de las Culturas Afro Mestizo and Vicente Guerrero Saldana. He was a revolutionary. Uh, this is in the museum at Quahini Quilap, and it had, it's a small museum, but wow, it had a lot of wonderful things. So I'm going to go through that. It showed the trade routes for slavery, it showed the ship, the La Ruta de Esclavos. And then, of course, you see the terror of enslavement and the brutality of enslavement. We've seen these pictures before. This was a huge diorama. It must have been about six or seven, eight feet tall, I'd say. And it was a painting of the men working in the mines. And if you look closely, you see some African men and you see some Native American men. I think the next slide shows it. Going across the bridge, you see Native Americans and then you also see Africans. So it showed this combined workforce in the mines. Gaspar Yanga and Yanga, Many people have never heard of Yanga, and uh, so I had a chance to uh, go to a town named for him. Uh, he said he's uh, from Gabon, he's royalty, arrived around 1570. He was a freedom seeker, okay? He wasn't a runaway. He might've called him a room, but he was a freedom seeker. He fought the Spanish uh, in the mountain of Gonzolica, and you see the mountain here, and in the cane fields of Veracruz, and the Spanish were moving out to take all their, their booty to uh, sail to, the, to uh, Europe, his people were hijacking and really had a lot of confrontations with him and ultimately he gains his freedom. So there's a, a remarkable statue and when I take people to Yanga to see this statue, I make them hold it, close their eyes until they get close and then open them and it's with awe that we see him. He's called the Premier Libertador de America. He and his followers fought the Spanish probably for more than 40 years. And here's a sign for him, El Pueblo y El uh, Gobernero, the governor of Mexico, uh, recognizes Yanga as the first liberator of America. Viva Yanga. 
Another hero out of Mexico, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon. Morelos was a priest, a revolutionary. He became the commander in chief of the forces that fought the Spanish for Mexico's independence. In Cuernavaca, the statue that's on the right and the left, I would pass it. And finally, someone said, oh, that's Morelos. He was black. I said, you mean I pass this all the time and I didn't know it was a black guy. It's a very powerful statue. The last time I was in Cuernavaca was in 2016. And my friend said, the governor or even the mayor, somebody moved that statue. I don't know why, because it's, it's, it's huge. He was assassinated by the Spaniards in 1815. But here you always see him. You couldn't tell the statue. He always has his head wrapped. I've seen many, brother, many brothers walk with the scarves and tighten up uh, the, their hair. And certainly he did that. In the picture on the right, certainly you can see uh, a kinkiness to his hair. Vicente Ramon Guerrero Saldana. He took up the helm after uh, Morelos was assassinated. And by the way, a state is named for Morelos and a state is named for Guerrero. He became the commander in chief and, and, and fought for Mexican independence and ended slavery, the notion of slavery in Mexico. He is, became El Presidente Vicente Oron Guerrero Saldana, who was the first African indigenous president of Mexico. Uh, this date is wrong, 1829 to 1831. My research this morning said uh, he was assassinated. He was elected in 1828 and he was from 1829 uh, April through December 17th. He was assassinated by his vice president. And certainly we know about Obama, the first African descent president of Mexico and the first African descent of the United States. Uh, Emiliano Zapata also was another revolutionary uh, in the Mexican revolution of African descent. Las Castas, I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly. I'll just show it. It was a, it's, it, there's a book of Las Casas. You can go online and see it. It, it was a space, Spanish racial classification where you get mulatto, you get moreno, you get many kind of classifications. You get, get uh, lobo, you get coyote. So here you have, it's formulaic on the, on the left. You have a woman who is mulata. She is, her, her husband is, uh, I can't read all of it or maybe he's mulatto, she's Spanish, and the child is something else, torn or atroce. They had all these racial characters. And often you have the images of the women fighting uh, the white man and look at the child. And so you see that in this antagonism of the black woman, how it's portrayed, I guess the angry black woman. Okay, here's some other pieces. And they would have an equation, Spanish plus negro, negra equals mulatto. And there was one part of this exhibit, it came to Los Angeles and it went a step further. It gave a psychological disposition for the mulatto. And they would say anyone who was paired with African, they would say prone to lie, prone to steal, shiftless, lazy, all of these descriptors that we know are, are, are throughout time. Uh, racist terminology. We use the term mulatto, it's an insult. It's from mulo, uh, a sterile freak from a horse and a donkey. Also it meant sneaky, perverse, without decency, vicious. And we use mulatto all the time. So I stop using it when I can. Zombo, which sounds like Sambo Zombo. Uh, it was reference to a monkey. Coyote was a light-skinned person of African heritage. And the coyote is considered a freak pairing of a wolf and a dog. Harocho, the Harocho music, we all know La Bamba, La 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 Bamba, love it. And if you go to Veracruz, oh my God, you hear the Harocho music. It's a, so Harocho was a black person from Veracruz and Arabic plus Spanish, it meant silly and S-H-I-T, a silly piece of blank. Uh, I, I, closest thing I can get is like, as young people have changed the meaning for them of the N word, uh, Harocho has changed and the music is quite exciting. Racist imagery, uh, I have this particular box I got when I was in a meeting in Mexico, Negrita. Negrita is not the derogatory, the image is. It certainly is picking any sandboyish kind of thing. I finally, it took me three years to find the oil from that box. And I finally went into a store where I found it. Blue-eyed Aunt Jemima, I was surprised. I went to a, a vendor and there were mammies. They were childlike, but you will see this polka dot, red and white polka dot with the blue eyes. 
you will see this in Mexico. And I was very disappointed. I want, two of my students uh, married and they were in Waltuco on their honeymoon and they saw this door to a restaurant and they sent it to me so I use it all the time. The notion of the Sambo. If you have seen Ethnic Notions, the, the film that came out in uh, the late uh, 1980s, 88, and they talk about we're respectable as servants and well-dressed. This piece I took from a travel book and here you have the lady on the right, full bosom, polka dot, painted black. This is at a carnival. And then in Yanga, I go to the Yanga Festival. Uh, it's in August. And I found this book in here. This is a man who's blackened his face. He's got the polka dot. Uh, and there's the Fiesta de la Negritude. And uh, the people that I knew in Mexico, I said, why is that? Because I, I told them how derogatory it was. And they said, why? Because he's African. We want to be African. I said, well, then you get some black people here to do it. Uh, you can, there was a float during the parade one year. And these little girls were on it. My heart went out to them because they did not look like they were happy about this. And here they are. So <laughs> it leaves me speechless every time I look at this. Let's move on. Then on my flight home in 2003, a Mexican airline, they had this cartoon in the book. You hear uh, a man going to, I guess, the African with the bone in his hair. He wants to go to a spa, get a bath. They're putting fruit around it. And later you see him being served. This was a Mexican airline and they thought that was cute. I was appalled. Mimin Pinging, I don't know if you've ever talked, about, heard about that. I say he's loved or racist or is, is it both? And so I put this piece together that I went to a conference in Mexico to show the history of this figure and it's coon image, it's picking in the image. And you know, there was a stamp in 2005 honoring Mimin Pinging. Uh, here you have from his comic book, you look at he, he can't count, he's counting his toes. He's looking at skeletal remains and trying to figure out what it is. And then his mom, if this isn't Aunt Jemima personified, I don't know what is. And when you see his friend, the little blonde guy with the glasses, all his friends are human, but he looks like a monkey. Here at the festival in Yanga, here's uh, a, a, a Mimin kind of character on a t-shirt. And here you have someone with a Mimin mask. And here the uh, Blanca Nieves is a soap. Does it mean like, uh, I think it was, I think it's the, the gold dust twins um, from black memorabilia, the racist uh, products that if you're that black, then this will make you so white like the dishes. Positive in imagery uh, from a town that I stayed in uh, with the family here, they have goats and you got goats on the right. And this was at one of the doors of uh, the school. And I'm just gonna run through these real quickly and just look at the images that I consider. These are all done by children. I love this one. On the door was a painting and here I ran across this sister with her hands on her hips. Okay, I love it and she's carrying wood, but she's sharp and a little girl uh, walking with carrying. Now, just because you carry something on your head, is that Africa? Uh, all over the world, people do this. But certainly I'm looking at the positivity of the art and uh, I can't say that's necessarily a, a retention, but we certainly know that it's a practice. Uh, they had a painting on the wall and these were really lovely paintings on the wall. Uh, artifacts at their annual conference. I love this guy on the right and certainly the one on the left, the Hagar, Hagwar. Uh, Oaxaca, Kenya. The image on the left is from Claremont, California. I went into a, a store and there it was, and then a painting out of Oaxaca. This young lady's in Oaxaca, quite beautiful. Walking down the street of Palenque and saw that box. It's the sun. I love the sun. Look at the lips. Okay, let's move on. This lady had a shop in Cuernavaca down the street from where I stayed. Uh, she has ladies with the fro. A very positive. She was happy. You better cruise the sun. Afro Caribeño Festival annually. I'd like to make that one day. And then in the festival at uh, Yanga, you have the lady to the right, the poster, very uh, brown skin, but the one who was at the parade was a bit lighter. And certainly I met the artist who uh, designed the outfit. These are just some other images. I love this little girl. Okay, love this lady on the left. I saw, found this in uh, Puerto Veracruz. Cruz. This guy uh, owned a club from Havana. And uh, I attended the church, uh, the family I stayed with, um, the daughter passed and I knew her, she was in her twenties. Very sad when I visited, but I looked up in the church and there you have St. Martin de Porras, who was, is a saint who comes from uh, Peru. 
going down the street one day in uh, Puerto Veracruz and my friend said, look up. And there this man was, I thought, ole. And I thought it was a bullfighter, but as I look at his clothing, I think it's a mariachi, but whatever his profession is, is beautiful. Okay, we're moving right along. Stop share. Can I, can I end this real quick? Can you give me five minutes? Oh, you can, yes, you can keep going. Oh, okay. Uh, this is at the church that's in the Zocalo, the Mex uh, Metropolitan Cathedral. And as you walk in, you see this black Jesus. Uh, forgotten the reasons for it. It's been, like I say, a while since I've been there. Uh, and certainly it has miracles attached to it. But as soon as you walk in the church, you see that. So I'm going to say, gracias, Mexico. Adios. And I can't say goodbye without my profound... Uh, appreciation and gratitude to the works of Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. This picture was taken in 1998. We were at Second Baptist Church. He was making a presentation and he had uh, a box of his books, Early America Revisited had arrived and he opened it and I was there. And it was the first time he'd seen the book because he'd gone back and forth with the publisher. The, the Omec head with the braids, they put it on the cover, but maybe they had one braid missing. So he had, was very frustrated. So when he opened the book there, he had the full braids. And so if you look at that book, it has uh, a little box with the Omec braids. And then it has what I what looks like marble. Then I looked at him and I said, oh, that's your hair. And he was happy to say that his wife, Jackie, designed that cover. So I say goodbye to my family. I was based at a uh, language school, Set Lalek, and my family I stayed with is at the top. The lady in the blue is the mother of the house. Her name's Tonya. Uh, all three of these folks are of African descent. And these are the teachers that helped me navigate my way through Set Lalek. It's the school I, I recommend. Um, lower picture on the right is my friend Michelle happened to come and attend the school while I was doing my sabbatical. And that just happens to uh, take pictures with the faculty. And let me say, Jorge, Jorge is the gentleman in the blue who's the director of the school. Uh, he passed a couple of years ago. So when I saw that this morning, I was touched. But he was my brother from another mother. And every time I'm back and forth to Mexico, he was the contact person. Even if my family wanted to get in touch with me, Jorge was the one. I'm so indebted to the, these families that took care of me. I went to Costa Chica. Father Glenn Jimmott, ironically, he's from Trinidad. And he went to school with the, the department chair. <laughs> in, in my department. And here on this evening, it had rained heavy. I had gone to say goodbye because I was leaving this community and going across the country to uh, Veracruz. And here these ladies stopped and they prayed for me and wished me well. And from then, when I left them, I headed to Veracruz into Olmec territory. This is a family I stayed with in Costa Chica, the Ibarra family. And if you look at the picture at the top, that young lady really looks like she could be my daughter. And these are the Ibarras that took excellent care of me. When I got to Veracruz and Yanga, this is the family. I look like I belong in this family. I asked their daughter who took me there, is there a hotel? And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And her mother's on the, uh, on the left. She reminds me of my grandmother who's short like that. She, her mother hugged me, kissed me, sat me down and fed me. And I have spent, every time I go, I stay with them. Uh, there's a town near Yanga called Mata Clara where they are more African in, in color and stop by to see them. The lady in the green, we were there on Father's Day and she says, couldn't you have found a group of people more ugly than we? And when she said that, I almost cried. What are you talking about? I said, I look like you. And I saw her a couple of years later, she said, oh, I didn't mean that, but my translator said, yes, she did. And so that really speaks to this inner self-hate that many people have. So while in Mexico, I climbed the pyramid of the moon Pyramid of the Sun and God a Blessing. I went to the bowels of the caves in Huslawaka. I sat at the base of Chalcatzingo where La Reina was there sitting on the throne. I was in Teposlan, which is a place where they say they have uh, sightings of extraterrestrials. I climbed the mountain and on top of that mountain is a pyramid and I got to climb that. I went underneath the sea and did scuba diving in search of Olmecs. And there, without peer, sisters without peer, after my sabbatical, I met Sister uh, Tanetta Muhammad, the wife of Elijah Muhammad in 2005. One of my students for my exhibit said she wanted to come. I didn't know who Mother Tanetta was. She came and met me. 
And this is at the museum where uh, I had my exhibit. She came with an entourage, so that's at the top of the picture. And I said, meet me in Yanga. This was 2005 and she met me in Yanga. And as I left her, I said, uh, let's think about doing a tour together. And the next year we ended up doing a tour, but this is in 2005 before we did the tours. And here's our tour in 2006. You can see we had an amazing time and I had everybody go to Yanga. And as we yelled Yanga and yay bo, which means right on. We had a wonderful time. Here we are on top of the pyramid, that pyramid earthen mound at La Venta. This is 2006, we were not allowed to climb it after that. Here we are at the Museo Tuxteco and that's where the Olmec head is with the braids, but this is the largest of the heads. And then we went to a place called Catamaco and there you get the stuff to cleanse your face and you get limpia where you're cleansed. And the student said, uh, Mother Tineta said, you have a jaguar on your face. And I didn't know what she was talking about until someone the took the picture. So I see a tail on the left and a, a mouth on the right. And so I carried spirit of the jaguar of the Olmex. And here we were getting Olympia, getting a cleanse in Catimaco. We move farther into Chiapas. We're going to a place called the Loncondon Rainforest, which is the second largest rainforest. And here we have the parrot is always there. And this in the Loncondon Rainforest is uh, an indigenous man who's Maya. And Van Sertima says in his book that the, that the Loncondon indigenous people are very isolated, but when they took the blood samples, they found traces of African heritage. And so we went wading in the, in the rainforest. Uh, I'm singing wade in the water as my colleagues are trying to get across that river. Here we are at a beautiful waterfall and the man in the middle, his name is Oscar Damas, an amazing guide. And he told me at one of the sites we went to, they had names of indigenous people. And he said, he pointed to a name and he says, those are my people and we are Egyptian. And I always thought if I had enough money, I would pay for him to go to Egypt with Radoko Rashidi. Unfortunately, uh, Victor has passed. And as we know this summer, Rashidi passed also. This lady on the right is the Long Condone uh, indigenous woman and very beautiful with one of the members of our group. We saw waterfalls. And then we got to Palenque uh, in Chiapas. And this man, his, his grandfather knew Mother Tineta. Uh, He was a shaman and he prayed for us. And then he brought out the crystal skull. I don't know if you know anything about the crystal skull. I didn't know anything. And he said, we all got to hold it. And he said, you don't have to ask for anything. It knows what you want. And so here I am with the crystal skull in front of the pyramid of Pakal. In my exhibit, this little boy passing by, I thought he was too cool, where black is brown. That information. Uh, 2009, Gaspar Yanga uh, was his anniversary, 400 years. And so I presented the museum with this poster. And so I say goodbye to the Olmecs again, grateful to so many people who carried me along the way. And I can't wait till I can be safe enough to get back to Mexico. And I say, Ashe, Asheo. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So everyone, thank you again for joining us. And I'm going to ask if you have questions for Dr. Humber to please post them in the Q&A box. And um, we're going to give you all a few minutes to start posing your questions. While you all are posing your questions, I want to just give a reminder for an upcoming event. So I'm just gonna post this real fast while the questions are coming in. So once again, Anthony Browder and Atlantis Browder will be speaking for the Hidden History of Africa Lecture Series Part Two. This will take place in Pompano Beach, Florida. So if you are in the area, please go to eventbrite.com, type in Hidden History of Africa Part Two, and you, uh, and we hope that you're able to join. All right. Okay, so uh, many things are coming in, Dr. Humber, for your presentation. They're thanking you for such a great presentation. Um, so there's a few questions coming in, and um, before we get to those questions, um, I would like to ask, you talked about 
um, some of the types of evidence that um, Van Sudema mentioned that people can use when doing um, this, this type of anthropological research. Can you speak to, um, you spoke a little bit about it, but can you speak more to your interactions with the people of Mexico and their, how they perceive themselves in their relationship with Africa? Were they clear about an African presence or African descent? Was it something that was known but hidden? And did it influence their religion any? Oh, I can't speak to the religion, but when I was in Mexico City and parts of Cuernavaca, Cuernavaca is maybe an hour from Mexico. Why are you here? I said, well, I'm gonna study African Mexicans. What? They act like they didn't know black people were there, particularly in Mexico City. Now, when you go to Veracruz, you can't help but see some black folks. And I had a taxi driver who was visibly, clearly a brother of color. And he was driving down a narrow street and there was a vendor and the vendor yelled, hey, Negro. So that wasn't derogatory. But I had an experience, uh, one of my last days there, I, I had been touring and I went to a Sunday marketplace and there was an indigenous woman on the, uh, with her, her wares on the ground and she had earrings. And I looked at them because I like earrings. And so I chose not to buy. And as I walked away, she said, Negra. Oh, you, you know, I get, I feel my blood rushing right now because I know what she called me. Okay. And I just looked at her and I just walked away. I just, you know, that was, I can, can only say that is only the negative thing that I had there. People were denying that they had African ancestry. And I'm gonna, not going to look at you and tell you that you have some ancestry because it is a very touchy thing. The family I stayed with in Cuernavaca, I saw pictures and uh, for instance, Tonya's father is a, looks something like my dad, okay? Uh, and then I asked them uh, when the last times I was there, well, have you had any feelings? And I tried to explain racism. The immediate family didn't, but the wife of one of the sons said, yes. And my niece told me she doesn't wanna be black. So it depends on where you are. Now, when I went into uh, Costa Chica, between Acapulco and Huatuco, I think it's a, like, at least the 200 mile span of, of communities. And they are aware of their blackness, but they're on some of the poorest land, poorest conditions. What is happening now, which, and, and I haven't had a chance to uh, read up on it, but for the census, for the 2020 census, they call themselves Mexico Negro and they fought to get a categorization on the census that they could identify as of African descent. And the importance of that is of course, it's money. When you have a population of a particular need, then the funds come in. And so they are really identifying. Every year uh, you have, um, it's called Encuentro. And it's a meeting of the communities, of the black communities. Uh, you saw that picture of uh, Father Glenn Jimmott who started that. And so I would say on the West Coast in Costa Chica, there's a greater sense of who they are. Now, when I was there beginning in 2003, from 2003 to 2010, I was there every year. Then I took a break and I went back in 2016 and I haven't been back since. I, it, to me, Mexico is like that, that uh, um, West Coast, Costa Chica, it, it's, it's like the awareness of the 60s. Uh, there's, there's art coming out This is, is quite wonderful in making a statement. And so you have people who are more conscious and more aware of who they are, of their African heritage, and, and certainly very, very proud of that. Now let's fast forward to the United States. I had an exhibit in 2016 in Los Angeles where Black is Brown. I was excited. I had a big room. I opened with African drummers, Azteca performers. And then when the drum stopped, a man who said he was from the United States, indigenous, uh, was very derogatory, let's just put it that way. Uh, and I was sad about it, but we went on with the program. And it shows this tension uh, that we have in this country. And so for me, uh, sharing this, Van Sertima says, we're talking about cultural influence. It doesn't say that everybody that, that was in, indigenous to Mexico is African. He talks about the influence in the culture and the history. And that's what I say. Uh, and so it varies. I mean, it varies in the United States. Let's go to the Caribbean. There are some Caribbean people, yes, I'm African, what happened? Others don't call me that. So it varies as much. And so when I 
ran through those images in the mean pinguin at the uh the in Quintro, I did a presentation there, only had a handful full of people. And this lady says, I love me mean because they read those comic books. I love, but I, so anyway, I presented it at the school when I got back to Cuernavaca. And I met with the teachers and the parents because there are parents who are hosts to the students. And Tonya was there. And so when we got back to her house that evening, I had some of the, the books. You can buy just you can buy me mean pinguin here in LA if you go to areas that sell uh, things that are pr primarily catered to Mexican people. And so she was looking at the book. I, I wish I could have videotaped her transfer. She was looking at the book and all of a sudden her face changed. Like they weren't getting what I was saying, how racist and derogatory it was. And all of a sudden it was like, I get it. And I thought, wow, that's a major victory there. So it's gonna take a lot of work. There are, there are young people who are, um, reaching hands and uh, working in terms of their identity. I mean, this is a world thing in terms of identity, but certainly Mexico is a part of it also. And why wouldn't it be? Because we're looking at the racism that came out of Spain and out of Portugal, out of, out of Europe that has infected this world. And it still is. When I was at uh, one of the last Yaga festivals, there was a, a family and the, they were from like Belize or someplace and they were very dark complexioned. And as I was leaving, we were there at night and we were pl playing drums and dancing and something. And the daughter grabs me, she said, would you bring me back some hair? I'm getting chills right now, I almost cried. Here, this girl is in Mexico, she's dark complexion. And I said, bring me something. I said, yeah. And she said, bring me some hair. As long as we have young people who say those kinds of things and can't look at themselves in the mirror and, and see their beauty and see their intellect, we still have a lot of work to do. And so I just consider this, you know, a grain of sand in the struggle. Uh, the tours that we took were not five star. I guess we were two, three star, whatever the star was, we didn't care. We were on a mission. So this, this, this trek was not, it took, uh, they were two weeks tours. This was not to sit in your hotel and drink and kick up your feet and go to the pool. This was exploration and to get information. And certainly mother Tanetta Muhammad was a facilitator. Uh, she made all the arrangements with her people and I just came and, and did the historical and the academic piece. And it was a, a wonderful pairing of the two of us uh, working together. Uh, I really am very grateful to her and, and the Nation of Islam, those people who traveled with me on that trip. And uh, I was surprised how well we got along. Uh, and, uh, you know, every now and then I would do something and then that could pull my chain a little bit. And then, okay, fine. There are a pull, you know, because I might have said something that it wasn't totally in alignment, but we had a remarkable relationship. And um, what I saw in Mother Tineta, and I, I don't even go into her religion, but what I saw in her was her brilliance. She had her hand touching so many cultures. At the time, uh, toward the end, she was preparing a presentation called Taha. She never took music, but she wrote music and she wrote a suite. And she was dealing with people in uh, Mongolia. She was bringing musicians from Mongolia to participate I mean, how many of us have been to Mongolia? But she knew the musicians in Mongolia. You know, we were walking down uh, along a lake and this man comes out and says, you know, curious because of how she dressed. And he says, come back, we wanna talk about Atlantis. And that night we went back and some man came in and they were talking Atlantis. Well, that's, first of all, I don't know Atlantis and I don't know the language, but I saw her transition into another kind of consciousness and spirituality that was profound and chilling. So the opportunities, for instance, the crystal skull. I would have never seen the crystal skull, Tony Hubbard going down to Palenque by myself. It was her influence and the people that she knew that provided that as an honor for our group. So, you know, there were many benefits of us as well as all of us were learning new information and people were coming up to us. And I found uh, one day I was in Veracruz, that was a Sunday by myself. And two young men uh, 
they were going into a bar and they invited me. I said, oh, no, thank you. And they said, are you Cuban? I said, no. And what else did they say? It was Cuban and, oh, Brazilian. They thought I was Brazilian. They thought I was Cuban. I said, no, US. And I kept going to what I had to do. So people couldn't figure out what I was, which was strange to me because I know who I am and I know what my parents are and I know my African heritage. But in these other settings, it could be ambiguous. And I don't consider myself ambiguous about my blackness. So um, to answer your question, I got all kinds of reactions depending on where I was. And again, I go back to that presentation to the teachers and parents that set like uh, the school. And as I was presenting, I got the but, but, but we love Mimi. Mimi, uh, this is 1945, Mimi becomes a comic book. The, the woman who wrote the comic book had a lover from Cuba, I think, and he jilted her. So she uh, made his character after this, this man, you know, that's, you know, that's the, the uh, urban myth about this. But the damage of thinking this is, and, and Mimin is a sweet little boy, but he's essentially like a monkey. They make fun of his mother. They make fun of him. And he's the brunt of jokes. And when I saw him, of course, you know, I had another attitude, but I think those of us who go down to explore, I can't tell people how to think about who they are from their cultural perspective, mm -hmm. but we could introduce them to some notions. And when I, like I said, I set myself up when I went down to talk about me mean, because I was talking about a, you know, a beloved character. It's like talking about Mickey Mouse, okay? Or, or, or a character like that. But these, yeah. these magazines they had, uh, these little comic books, people learn to read from them. And so he is a beloved character. What is beloved to you is racist to me and hurtful to me. When I'm going to the festival in Yanga and I see little girls in blackface, mm -hmm. I, it was hard to contain myself. I said, what? I was shocked because in Yanga, the people who live in Yanga are pretty mixed. When I went to Mata Clara, I mentioned Mata Clara, uh, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes down the road, when the lady said, couldn't you have found someone more ugly than we? Most of the people there are darker complexion and they live away from Yanga. They're not in the town of Yanga. I didn't get into the politics of that. So, you know, colorism is there. We understand colorism is there, mm -hmm. but they're working through it. And then there are young people I see on, um, some of the uh, Zoom, I've seen a couple who are, I saw one from Northridge, Cal State Northridge here, uh, really talking about the research they're doing and they're, you know, in terms of contemporary populations and going back into the history of since enslavement. Uh, they're really working on that and consciously working on their people. One last thing I wanna say, uh, when I showed the skeletal remains at Campeche, one of my students made a presentation, you know, I give them all kinds of stuff to do and they come up with all this good stuff for me. And I said, okay, I'm gonna go there. So I went to Campeche in 2016. And with my friend, Ed, we were trying to find this gravesite. We knew it was there. We had seen it in the paper and, we, and it's in a little town square. It wasn't very big at all. And there was a church across the street. So when they were excavating to build the new church, they found an old church buried and they found the burial ground. And there they found the remains. So we go to a, a restaurant down the street and we're having dinner. And then I asked the wait waitress, do you know where this gravesite is? She said, no, but I know somebody who knows. So she goes, gets a waiter. And he says, yes, I passed by it every day when they were digging the hole and I saw the skeletons in the, in, in the, in the ground. So my question was, did they cover the skeletons up or did they move them? I don't know but this is Tony Humber thing. Those skeletal remains, they can trace to Elmina Castle in the Elmina, Elmina area in Ghana. I'm putting this out to the world. I would love to see us, number one, get the permission to get just a teeny sampling of the remains and take it to Ghana. That would be, the celebration would be just be absolutely wonderful. I was at Howard when the remains from the African burial ground were brought to the anthropologist Blakey. Howard had a big celebration and I thought, well, this would be the same kind of thing. So anyway, that's one of my dreams. And it's an, it would be an international incident that the African diaspora would converge on Campeche and say, we want to honor and put, because there's no plaque or anything to identify where these remains are. 
We only knew where they were according to the man that told us. And so at least a plaque to acknowledge that this is considered the oldest burial ground in the Americas. Wonderful. So um, um, a few people are actually asking, um, I'm gonna combine this in one, are there any trips planned um, to visit Mexico? Um, and specifically, are there any trips planned by you or any other African-centered uh, groups planning any trips? I don't know. And, and, and a lot of people, like, while I was there, oh, this is in 2003, I ran across a young man who taught at Spelman. And he says, oh, we've been coming every year. Who knew? I'm on my own little personal journey following the guidelines of some places uh, that Van Sertima told me. And there have been universities that have been going down to Mexico all along, not my university. So my dream is to take students down there for a serious, I spoke to someone who works at uh, one of the uh, UC schools this afternoon. And I said, I would love to take your students down there. Now, I'm uh, a senior elder nowadays. I'm up in age. Uh, <laughs> pray that I'm in good health, that I could, because it is a rigorous trip. So I would love to go. Uh, I'm hoping that I could handle it. I don't know, because you know we're, I'm COVID safe. So until COVID is straight, my friend at the university told me last year when I spoke to her, she says, Tony, it is not safe for you to come now. And when she says it's safe for me to go, I will go. And I hope that I can go next year for the 20th anniversary of my uh, sabbatical. I would love to have a celebration to acknowledge those communities that supported me, those families that, that just shared everything with me. The one in Veracruz when I went with her daughter to visit Yanga, mm -hmm. Every time I go, I stay with them. They move somebody else out of a bed and put me in it. I said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. No, 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 no. So I have had people more accommodating and gracious to me than I could ever be to them. And that's the Mexico I know. Now there may be another side of Mexico. I don't see it, but in terms of as a traveler being accepted, and maybe because I, I think Dr. Humber helped in my intensity. Look, I have 12 weeks on this sabbatical. I got to go here, 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 here. I have to get this information. I have to have a Spanish speaking facility so that I could get around because I traveled by myself for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't playing, <laughs> you know, I wasn't, I wasn't hanging out to the end that I went to Cancun for a week. Wonderful. For 11 weeks, I was busy. <laughs> that's what I was supposed to do. I was on sabbatical. Okay. okay. So th that was now when I came back to set Lalik after my sabbatical, there were some Cal Poly students who were in the language school and they were in their twenties. late. Mm -hmm. And I looked at them and I thought uh, they were all women. I said, how would these young women traveling by themselves in Mexico as I had, how safe would they be? I'm traveling as someone in my fifties. And here I'm looking at these 19, 20, 21 year olds. If they traveled singularly as I did, and I took buses when I was on sabbatical, I took a bus all over. That's how I got around. I didn't have a tour guide. I was the guide. I was following dots on a map. I'd find somebody who would take me the next. I, 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 I took risks. I was getting in cars from people who said they were guiding. That's fine, take me. And so I believe you know, my angels were with me on that one. But mm -hmm. how would younger women in particular traveling by themselves like that, how would they have fared without being harassed because they're young women and cute and bodies and all that? Stuff? I, I can't answer that. But I did think about that when I saw my some of our students when we got to, uh, when I returned back to Cuernavaca before I came home. Okay. But, but I, don't know if, I don't know of any tours. And in my heart, I want a tour. I'd like a couple of tours next year that I could, travel with people and really enjoy this experience once again, because it was a life-changing experience for me. There, there if you do have another tour, please share it with us and we can then share it with the IKG community. And that way, if it, if it does come up or if you do hear one, um, you let us know and we can let, let the audience know. Right, well. Uh... If it comes up, if it comes up, you know, people are asking. Oh, well, like I said. It might if, not be you, maybe someone else. If, if, if yeah. uh, we get COVID safe, in a, because I wasn't going, I didn't go to big cities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was in small communities off the right. way that's off the map. I okay. saw a little dot and I went to the big dot 
So I knew I could get to the little dot. That's how I got there. That's how you got there. Well, I speaking of all your travels, um, Nadra Raw wants to know, do you plan on publishing any of your work? Or have you no, published? I haven't published it, you know, you, you can slap my hands, but I really would like to videotape. Next year, I'd like to retrace my steps in the sabbatical, uh, videotape it and make it accessible that way. Okay, okay. Um, Rebecca Tate asked, did you come across the argument of the Almec being of Filipino origin? No, I didn't. Did, did not uh, come across that at, at all. But okay. in Oaxaca, I, I had one of the pictures was an orange background and a, and a young woman was holding uh, a flower with a, a brown face. I don't know if you remember that I was going so fast. And she looked very Filipina. And there's a reason for that, because we know there was that contact uh, during the colonial period on the uh, West Coast. And matter of fact, I read somewhere where mole, if you know mole, the sauce that's made in Mexico, that mole and even the embroidered bodice on dresses might have been influenced by a Chinese woman. So the sea, the high seas were open. People were coming from everywhere. But I hadn't heard the Filipinos being an influence in terms of the Olmecs. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Dr. Lady Deanne. She says that her daughter is Black Mexican American and had a hard time being accepted by the white and Blacks alike. She was in between and experienced racism that hurt her feelings till today. What can you recommend as a way of dealing with people who are mixed, uh, mixed stock and dealing with their self-esteem that you dealt with in Mexico? Wow. It, you know what? When I showed the picture of the family in Cuernavaca that took care of me, I pointed to the lady in the blue. Her name is Tonya. She was standing next to another lady. I've forgotten her name. And this other lady had a granddaughter. And I went to dinner at her house. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the little girl never put her head up. Cute little girl. It was considered a troublemaker in school. But she went to school with the people that didn't look like her. Her mother had African ancestry, but she had the long hair. This little girl had hair like mine or kinky. Okay. She was having a hard time. I go down to Costa Chica. It's a whole nother story. I thought I need to bring this little girl down here. And matter of fact, I left her some of my hair products before I left because they didn't know what to do with their hair. Mm -hmm. So that was an issue there for me, that person experience. And, you know, education is elevating in terms of our psyche and who we are and getting self-love. Uh, I had two students who were, were twins and they are African Mexican. And they told me before I left and retired, they said, it's because of you, we can say that we're proud of who we are because they had been so beaten down. You know, the issue of mixed, if your hair is a certain texture, your certain color, then you, you're considered more privileged than those who are darker. So, so it's, it's the colorism, colorism issue that is just beating people down. And, um, Reading, there are so many wonderful books that people can read, young people can read in terms of elevating who they are, self-concept. Obviously, I like reading historical information, um, the cultural information, and celebrating who we are when we celebrate who we are. And not look at the TV and think all we are are people who cuss a lot and are thugs. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been in South Africa. There was a woman I met, a, a remarkable woman who was responsible for 60,000 people registering to vote to vote for Mandela, okay? So mm -hmm. we bring her to Los Angeles and, and, and California. And I was showing the film, Ethnic Notions. If you haven't seen Ethnic Notions, it came out in 88 and I can't think of the guy's name. It's a wonderful piece on stereotypes in film. And she saw that and I said, her name is Lindy. I said, what do people in South Africa think of black Americans. And she said, they're black, black with big hair and big red lips. And I laughed, I said, that's what the stereotype of you. So across the ocean, we're taught to hate each other. And seeing international students from Africa and the Caribbean, I went to Howard, and certainly there was a privilege they had over those who were homegrown because we were all considered quote unquote, and I hate the term ghetto, whatever. I mean, all of these misconceptions and, and, and the levels of poverty that suck us down in terms of an image uh, that we're not. I grew up in Watts until I was nine or 10. Yeah, my father was the Watts, you heard of Watts, California. My father was yeah. a Watts boy and proud of it. 
Okay. <laughs> and so, and, and, and so through struggle, you know, my parents were parents of the depression. I'm, I'm a person of the civil rights and we keep moving and moving. But unfortunately I hear some of the same stories by this little girl you just said that I heard back during my time and that I heard from my students at Cal Poly. I had a student who said, cute, she uh, has about three children now, but she said, she used to put her hands over her mouth because they made fun of her lips. She had full lips. What? I mean, it, th there are so many painful moments daily, the assault on the black psyche that the parents and anyone around who can hug them and love them and make, feed their mind and uh, let them appreciate the dynamism of who they are and what they hold inside. That's a change. When I started teaching these classes, uh, African uh, uh, history classes, I realized, boy, I really had been uh, post-traumatic <laughs> slave syndrome because I went to Bernalli White Schools and I chose Howard. I said, before I die, I'm going to HBCU. 41, I went to Howard. Here we go. Okay, Here we go. Um, a couple of people want to know, um, if you could talk about your relationship with Renoko Rashidi. Oh God, Renoko. And I know this Please. might take, I, I know um, there's a few more questions and I know we're coming up on time. So I don't know if you want to end with that because it might. No, no, let me answer while I can remember. Okay. I've known Renoko since 1980. 1980, LeGrand Clegg at the attorney Clegg had an exhibit, the glorious, 18th dynasty in Egypt. It was a, and I went there and through Legrand, I met Renoko. And Renoko was at UCLA. He was, you know, doing this research. And we used to have a study group in my living room before I had furniture. That's how far back we go. And we would sit and there were three of us. And I wasn't always doing the reading and the other guy wasn't, but Renoko was on his case. And so I saw his growth, um, you know, and I went to Egypt with him and have known him since the 80s. And um, Matter of fact, he ended up going to Mexico. He went with Mother Tanetta. They went to Costa Chica. And I didn't show any of the Costa Chica stuff. And I mean, that's a whole, you know, I ran through a whole bunch of stuff, but I just want to at least give you an overview that it's more than the Olmecs that we should be serious about. You just can't exclude the other. But I even gave him some places to go when he went to Mexico and contacts that he should have that would make his journey easier. And so I'm uh, just so sorry that he's gone, but uh, he was a tremendous researcher and scholar. Yes, well, I share, I share in, in blessings to his spirit, um, yes. to Renoko Rashidi, who I'm sure um, energy is now just everywhere. Thank you um, for sharing. Your... Yeah, and just let me say his fire. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just looked at uh, our Karaz Unity Church here had, uh, uh, to play the tape of Van Sertema on, on Friday and I saw it and I said, I told a friend, I really missed that fire. The indignation of how can these people even say this with this information laid before them and Renoko was incredulous with the ignorance. We're in, once you start reading, you become incredulous and it's hard to believe people can be so ill-informed when the information is right there. We'll just take 1619 as an example. I just, mm -hmm. I read this summer, I read 400 uh, Souls. Wonderful. If you haven't read Cast, The Warmth of Others, I mean, we can go on and on and on. And some people pick it up with that. And then those who get it, it's, it's like food for the soul. We're starved for this affirmation of who we are and of our journey. And so we have to just continue. I'm, re I'm retired. I retired in 2016. So I've been taking a few little breaks. So this past week, you had me real quick <laughs> up until before you turn this camera on <laughs> and i realized okay. that this is what i gave you is superficial and it's there's a depth, there's yeah. a depth that is the life work and research of others and mm -hmm. through academia and even independently because renoko did not take the academic route he chose another route and we thank him for it yes mm -hmm. thank you um Indra gandhi asked what can you say about the talk of UFO appearances spoken of by the people who say that they were seen in Mexico? Well, you know, there was one of those pictures. I was on top of the mountain and I had my hands up like this. That place is called Tepotzlan. 
I love it. It looks like if you've been to uh, what's the place in Arizona that not the Grand Canyon. Oh God, there's there's a place in Arizona where they have the Red Rocks, and it's you know it's a, a new age. Anyway, Temple Salon reminds me that it has these sharp uh, Buttes Mountains that are really green. And when you climb up the mountain, there's a pyramid on top. And they tell me that they have UFO sightings. And the town comes to life on Saturdays and Sundays. And then it shuts down on Monday. So it's a weekend thing where tourists come. You can get massages. You can do Tema scales. You can get readings. All of that stuff. But the, the people say they see sightings. Mm -hmm. I'm looking too. Where is it? <laughs> but uh, I didn't. I didn't explore that. What, what I had to do, and what I do on these tours is just uh, it's heavy. But when I look at the old Mac monuments that were found and buried, maybe somebody can help me with this. What position were they buried in? Were they face down or if they're face up? If they're faced up, which one of the stars were they gazing at? That's a question. I mm. came up with that since I've been on sabbatical. I mean, you know, retired and got a whole lot of time to, to think about stuff like that. <laughs> we don't have a lot of time to do the research, but some of these pieces, for instance, that astronomer piece, if it was buried vertically, if it was buried face down, or if it was buried face up, and if it was faced up, what was it looking at, even though it is buried? We look at the alignment of the stars with monuments. Now, when they dug these monuments up, they might have, well, first of all, why were they buried? Where were they? I mean, there's so many things we don't know. Mm -hmm. But where were they in relation to the alignment of the stars? Now, when you go to the Jalapa Museum, and I hope all of you go, whether you go with me or you just go on your own, you go to the Jalapa Museum. And the second Olmec head you see, the first Olmec head is kind of marginal. It's Olmec. It's, it's, it's a white stone. And then the second one you see, is an Omic head and above it on the, on the ceiling is an outline of the jaguar. And then on his helmet is the jaguar skin. And they believe that the jaguar, that the spots on the jaguar align with the stars. I believe that, and they consider this a spiritual animal. So this whole, and I haven't, I haven't studied the jaguar to that degree, but those are the kinds of things that are intriguing, they go to spirituality, but they also go to the acknowledgement of looking at the heavens and understanding the heavens, the alignment and phenomena that comes out of the sky as the world moves. And so we need more people who can explain that. So there's this, this area is so wide open and there are people who are resistant because they don't wanna hear it, uh, feeling that black people sold, you're claiming everything when you say the Omex are black. There are mm -hmm. Olmec images, particularly the masks that look more indigena, more indigenous, but those stone heads looking very African. Now, it's superficial to say, I'm looking at the lips and the nose and what have you. Again, where's the DNA? That stone doesn't have the DNA, but I told you, El Manatee and the Tusteco Museum, if they still have those remains of uh, children who had been in a bog and they can mm -hmm. date it back to the... All you need is a little teeny piece of flesh, put it on the microscope, do whatever you say. And then it's a moot point. We know that. That Casca Hall stone that they can trace back, I think maybe 800 you know, BC or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that it had the glyphs and who else had glyphs like that? And this, these glyphs were unique, were unique language structures as I understand that you didn't find in some of the other languages. So there are people who are linguists and archaeologists who, you know, someone who's interested in this. There's, there's just a wide open field. I just got this as a hobby. Mm -hmm. And um, it, my research wasn't in that because I was teaching African-American studies and all that. And I only had a, you know, couple of weeks where I would introduce that. But I was very active in terms of going to lectures and what have you and learning more and, and, and uh, working on my own. But... Okay. Uh, Okay, great. Well, I'm gonna. Um, there are a few, a few more questions, but what I'll do is I'll ask one um, final one um, from Carol Asperone. Has the Mexican government apologized to its black population for slavery, 
and how are they seen in history classes in their schools? Okay, you know what, I would go to someone in Costa Chica, they, those who have been, who are on the fighting field, uh, those in that uh, professors who uh, specialize in the African presence and what have you, because I don't know, I'm not there. Has the Mexican government uh, apologized? Did the United States government apologize? Bill Clinton did a little weak one, but just saying I'm sorry is not enough for me. Uh, let's talk about a little reparations and uh, let's, let's talk about the, the, the compensation in terms of how do we rec rectify the disparities? So uh, who apologized for something the other day? It wasn't sincere. It was that, that Lady Green, whatever in the Senate, she gave some little weak acceptance. So the government is not gonna apologize. So I, I don't, obviously I don't put a lot of faith in that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I enslaved uh, 200,000 people in Mexico. I'm sorry that uh, I put you in shackles and chain. I whipped you. I, I bred you. I made is sure there that- any, there in, in the history books? Pardon? Um, in the history books or in the curriculum? I haven't, I, I, I haven't studied that and I don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay. Espanol is poco. So someone who was in that research and there are young African Latino scholars that are doing this work. I just don't know them because I'm not at the university, so I'm out of touch with a lot of that. Yeah. But, yeah. but they are there, they're doing the research. They're looking at labor. They're looking at labor practices. They're looking at the disparities between labor for women and labor for men. Uh, there are many uh, areas of uh, research that people can go into, but I can't answer that because I live here. And, and I haven't, that hasn't been my focus. I'm just getting some little surface history that I'm excited to learn. And hopefully that it piques the interest of others to have a greater depth in understanding the people. And that in Los Angeles, where I live, uh, that we come together in unity. There is an assault upon people of color, black and brown in particular, or Asians too. Mm -hmm. That we come together and whatever differences we have a rub about, we better get together. You know, divided, uh, united we stand, divided we fall. That if we could break those chains of uh, my particular oppression is worse than your oppression, and you don't like me because my skin, and then, and even as a professor, I, I would say things to my students and they come back. And so, uh, anthropology professor said, That's not true. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> uh, my grandmother said, That's not black. Uh, you know, this thing is so, racism is so deep and insidious. Uh, Sister Nicole, Hannah Jones, all those who are writing these texts, if you read Cass, if you don't read any book and you read Cass to understand the structure of, she doesn't use uh, racism, but understand the structure of the system that we are, that has been designed to do what it is doing now, that is choking us in terms of voting. The system yeah. is doing what it's supposed to do. Yes, yes. Don't take well, it personally. It was designed mm -hmm. this way. It was designed this way, yes. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Humber, um, for joining us for our first Wisdom Wednesday of 2022, um, for an absolutely informative presentation. Um, it really had the audience involved. There was so much discussion going on in our chat. Really? Oh, good. Yes. Um, so now we'll be sharing that with you, but a lot of discussion in the chat. So thank you so much for inspiring this dialogue. Um, I would like to invite you all again, every third Wednesday, we have our Wisdom Wednesday lecture series. Next month, February 16th, we will have Martina Vital speaking on a, having with a financial literacy um, presentation. And she will be speaking on insurance, the solid foundation to financial security. So at Wisdom Wednesday, we talk on a plethora of topics related to Black people. So we do encourage you to come out. And you can also go to ikgculturalresourcecenter.com to be made aware of all future Wisdom Wednesday programs, as well as other events that um, IKG puts on. So be sure to sign up for our mailing list to be aware and up to date on those different activities. Before we close out, Dr. Humber, I do wanna give you the last word. And wanna also ask if people wanna get in contact with you, is there a website 
or an email address that I can put in the chat for you. For you can who want to contact. Give me my email. Let me say this. I'm a low tech person in a high tech world. Let's get real now. <laughs> you know, I'm <laughs> challenged today. I have bought some website domains, but I don't have a website. Okay. And so I'm going to, you know, I'm trying to pull it together. And when I get a website, then what am I going to do with it? <laughs> you know, I, 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 I need help in terms of pulling all this stuff that I know. What will I do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I haven't done it yet. And I have had other projects. By the way, you see this? Wait, where is it? See that right there? That is yeah. the papyrus. I forgot it was there. That is the papyrus of the opening of, no, which one is that? Yeah, that's the papyrus. So this is the priest right here. And he's got his hand out. It's not clear. And he's got the scepter. And here is the pharaoh with the beard. And, and the priest with the uh, leopard, he's got orange and yellow. Let me take it down and I'm gonna bring it up. But, but you saw it here, let me take it off the wall. So Renoko had his tour guides. Get this made for me. Now, can you get it on? Can you get it? You see yes, it? Yes, we, we see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I cried when they handed it to us. We're getting on the bus to go to the airport. They said, we have something for you. And they had that. Because you can't mm -hmm. buy this. You know, I have a lot of papyrus in my house. And I thought, well, I could just go buy it. Couldn't. And so they knew I was interested in it. And every time I saw papyrus, I was trying to buy this. And so he had it made for me, that, which I thought was really, really generous. And they gave it to me. I was willing to pay oh, anything. Awesome. They just gave it to me. I mean, that's the generosity of people when I think your, your heart is into the research and uh, you're really sincere and you're trying to do your work. Yes. So that's what I've tried to do. So thank you so much. I, 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 should I put your email? For, pardon? Did you want me, do you want me to share your email address? Yeah, you can share it. Okay. Now, I'm not the best on email. I understand that, but I will get to you eventually. Okay, I'm going to type that in the chat. And yes, I'm sorry you were you were giving your um. Your so COVID so then I and I also want to thank um, Brother Tony Browder again. When I was at Howard, I would do Howard during the day, and then I'd go upstairs at the Howard Inn and sit in on uh, the study groups there, and uh, you know saw quite a few wonderful people come through there, including Van Sertema, John Henry Clark, you know. Uh, in LA, uh, Le attorney LeGrand Clint and, Re and Renoko Rashidi at Compton College had an amazing uh, forum to bring scholars to. So I had all that benefit before I stepped on Howard's campus, uh, you know, to do what I had to do in terms of to uh, finish my degree. So, but I want to thank Tony for uh, extending my name and uh, this invitation. And certainly I do. I, I thank you so much for your help. Uh, because, Absolutely. you know, I just said, I'm a low tech person, but we found a way to get my found and way. And that, yeah. that uh, my, my PowerPoint. So now I know, and I won't be uh, so ignorant, but I have tried to make presentations before and, and we just couldn't figure it out. So I, well, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for uh, again, your wonderful knowledge. Thank you everyone for coming out. Um, and we look forward to you all joining us next month. I am Ajwa and this is Dr. Humber and you all are you and we thank you and thank you for your energy. Have a great evening. You too. Yay, Bo. Hold on, Dr. Humber. Um,